So I'm going to be talking about differences and differences today, and I'm going to stick to a fairly basic introduction, assuming that you know nothing about the topic. So I'm kind of the warm-up act for Professor Wildridge, who's coming up uh, right after me. So this might be break time for the econometricians in the room. Uh, you probably know most of this. Um, so you can download all the materials, uh, the slides, the data sets, and do files from this talk at tinyurl.com slash stata DID. Uh, so everything's up there. And here's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to start with a question just to kind of motivate our interest. And then I'm going to follow through with a uh, just an intuitive introduction uh, to what is difference and differences. What's the idea? And then we'll work a simple two, what's often called a two period, two groups model, sort of the basic version. And then we'll try a couple of variations using repeated cross-sectional panel data and longitudinal panel data. And then I will uh, offer some uh, links and things for more information if you're interested. I'm happy to take questions along the way. So if you have questions, just uh, jump in however you like. Um, otherwise, we'll catch them at the end. So, okay, so let's start off here. At the top of the slide, I have a map of the United States. And uh, well, I guess I should really start with what I'm interested in. Uh, MLDA stands for Minimum Legal Drinking Age. And over the history of the United States, the minimum legal drinking age was different depending on which state you lived in. So as of 1970, states that are shaded in blue here had minimum legal drinking ages uh, 21 or greater, at least 21 years of age. The states that are colored in red had a minimum legal drinking age less than 21, usually around 18 or 19 years of age. And so this map shows the, uh, the again, shade, the sh states are shaded based on their law as of 1970. At the bottom of the slide, I have a time series plot of the traffic deaths among people aged 18 to 20 years. And if you kind of follow along, it looks like around 1980, there was a fairly dramatic decrease in the number of uh, traffic fatalities in this 18 to 20 uh, year old age group. It doesn't look very dramatic when you stretch the graph to the side, but in normal in a normal aspect ratio, it's a fairly dramatic decrease beginning around 1980. And then around 1990, there was another decrease so that by, by 1996, uh, the number of traffic deaths had fallen by almost half um, compared to their 1990 levels. And the obvious question is, well, what led to this? Why was there such a dramatic decrease in traffic deaths uh, from 1970 to 1995, particularly 1980 to 1995 or 96? <laughs> well, one uh, thing that people speculate is that these laws in the United States changed uh, between 1970 and 1996. And uh, so, in fact, I have a little uh, visualization, a uh, little animation here. This is the little red line in the time series plot is showing you where we are in time. And the map is showing you which states still allow people under the age of 21 to purchase alcohol. And as you can see, the further we go along in time, the more states have increased their legal drinking age to 21. So there's uh, long been speculation that these uh, laws, the increasing of the drinking legal drinking age, caused or led to or at a minimum influenced the decrease in traffic deaths in this age group. But it seems fairly obviously obvious when you watch the animation, but we need a statistical way to show this. We can't just show people an animation and, and draw conclusions. So we need a statistical method that will allow us to uh, to assess these kinds of or answer these kinds of questions. So what I'm going to do, the question I'm going to ask is, let's use 1980 as a point, a special point in time. We're going to look at states. We're going to consider states who had a drinking age of 21 prior to 1980 as the treated group. And we're going to consider people who implemented their uh, or increased their drinking laws to 21 after 1980 as the control group. And we're going to ask the question, does the treatment or control directly influence the, uh, the proportion of traffic deaths? So again, to answer this question, we're going to need some new statistical tools. It's new to, new to uh, many of us anyway. So before we try and tackle that question, let's just walk through a really in, what I think is a fairly intuitive explanation of something called difference in differences. So let's say that we have an outcome that we're interested in. So the vertical axis here is our generic outcome Y, something we're measuring. 
And we're measuring this over time. So I'm going to take one measurement at time pre and another measurement at time post. So in this case, I'm following this group and whatever this outcome is seems to be decreasing a bit over time from time pre to time post. But let's say that some uh, intervention, something happens along the way between time pre and time post, and I'm going to call it a treatment, but it could be an intervention. Usually this is in the context of observational data. It's not usually done as an experiment, although it can be. And so something happens in between pre and post that changes the trajectory of the outcome or the level of the outcome. And the thing that I'm really interested in is the, the magnitude of that change. Uh, at that point in time. And I'm going to refer to that, the magnitude of that change as the average treatment effect among the treated, or ATET for short. I'm just going to call it ATET. That is the effect of the treatment on the outcome. And that's what I'm interested in. But here's the problem I don't directly observe the ATET. What I observe is Y at time pre, the outcome at time pre, and I observe the outcome at time post. That's what I actually observe, not the ATET. And so if I were to estimate the difference between Y at post and Y at time pre, that's going to, in my example, it's going to grossly overestimate the average treatment effect among the treated. Uh, in other examples, it could underestimate, overestimate, it depends on the specifics of the example, but there's no guarantee that that difference is going to accurately estimate the average treatment effect among the treated. We also have another issue that we need to deal with, which is the fact that that treatment could just be a coincidence. Uh, we've been following this group along their outcome from time pre to time post, and maybe it's just a coincidence that the treatment happened along the same time of something else that was the actual cause of the uh, the change in the trajectory here. So we're gonna need to do something else. Just, just calculating the difference pre and post is not gonna get us what we want. So what we can do is we can find a control group in order to sort of rule out the possibility of other observed or unobserved confounders or causes of this change in the trajectory. We could go out and find ourselves a control group that is as similar as possible to the treatment group in every way, except that they were not exposed to the intervention or the treatment. And so we could measure the control group at time pre and time post as well and see how those compare to the outcomes for the treatment group. So what we could actually do specifically is we can measure the difference at time pre, we can measure the difference between the outcome in the treatment group and the outcome in the control group. So that would be the difference, what I'm going to call diff pre. That's the difference between the two groups in time pre. Similarly, on the right side of the slide, I can measure the difference between the outcome at time po I can measure the outcome in the treatment group. Oops, I'm botching this. I can calculate the difference between the outcome uh, in the treatment group minus the outcome in the control group at time post. It's a tongue twister. So now I've calculated diff post, and I can actually estimate the average treatment effect among the treated, the ATET, is simply the difference between diff post and diff pre. And that's where the name com comes from, this uh, difference in differences. It's the difference in two differences, ergo the name. Now, this, uh, this technique depends very heavily on a particular assumption, and that assumption is that these two uh, trajectories in the treatment group and the control group are parallel. It's called the parallel trajectories assumption. And here's the reason that it's important. Um, let's say that the trajectory was not quite as steep in the control group. Uh, what we will end up with if we actually calculate diff minus diff, diff post minus diff pre is we're going to slightly underestimate the actual average uh, treatment effect, ATET. And so by the if the slopes are not parallel, we're actually going to slightly bias our estimate of the ATET. Okay. And so we're this parallel trends assumption is very, very important for the estimation of that ATET. And again, that's the thing we're interested in. The ATET is the effect on the, the, the effect of the treatment or intervention on the trajectory of the outcome in the treated group. Okay. Now, how do we estimate this? 
Well, we could just estimate, we could calculate those uh, averages at different points, but it's traditional and a little easier in some ways to use regression modeling to actually estimate the ATET. So what I can do is I can set up a regression model like I have here in the title. So the expected value of the outcome, given the group and time uh, of each of the, the measurements, is going to be equal to beta 1, which is just going to be my slope. So I have a slope of, uh, excuse me, not a slope, an intercept of beta 1. And then I'm going to add beta two times group membership. Group is just an indicator as to whether or not the observation is a member of the treatment group or the control group. Plus beta three times time. And time is simply an indicator for pre or post. Okay, one or zero, one is post. And then I'm going to, going to include an interaction term. So I have beta four times the product of group times time. So that's gonna be the regression model I set up. Now, how does that estimate the average treatment effect? Well, beta one is simply this intercept term down here. That's the outcome in the pre -group, in the control group at time pre. Beta two measures the difference between the treatment group and the control group at time pre. So that's beta two's role in this equation. And then beta three estimates the difference between the outcome at, in the treatment group at time pre and the outcome in the treatment group at time post. So that's the role of beta three in that equation. But here's the punchline. Beta four estimates the difference between the outcome at time post in the treatment group and the outcome at time pre in the control group. I think I said that correctly. But although hopefully the lines make it clear whether I said it verbally correctly or not. Anyway, that differential, that beta four, happens to equal beta four up here, the average treatment effect among the treated. And that is what we're interested in. And so we're going to fit these kinds of models and pay special attention to beta four because that's the treatment effect that we're interested in, okay? So that's kind of the int intuition. I think I'll pause here for any quick questions. I like to pause along the way and take quick because it's easier to flip around between slides, but, uh, okay. Yes, there's one well, question in the chat, if I may just read. Oh, that. okay. I, I don't see it, but please go ahead. Um, can we apply DID in mixed effects models called DID mixed effect models? Is that a, something you're aware of? Um, I'm not familiar with that, but again, I'm I'm a biostatistician, and I am far from being an expert in uh, difference and differences. Um, if somebody else has a good answer for that, they're welcome to jump in. But what we're going to be doing shortly, we are effectively dealing with cluster data, and I will address that shortly. Um, in this context, we're going to address it using cluster robust standard errors. Um, right. But I don't know if that's another technique that I'm just not familiar with. There's another question about the DID, whether it's um, able to estimate the average treatment effect, the ATE, or is there a reason why you focus on the average treatment effect on the treated? <laughs> um, I believe that's just a question that people are interested in. I honestly don't know the answer to that one either. Again, I apologize for not being a real expert in this. Fortunately, we have one coming up right after me. Um, I don't know. My understanding is this is the thing of the, the um, quantity of interest uh, that researchers are interested in. Um, so that's another one. I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that one. Yeah, I don't think it's that easy to actually derive the, the average treatment effect from, from a difference in difference. If you have randomization, okay. it's a different issue. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure the I'm econometricians in the room all know the answer to that question, but uh, <laughs> I'm not, so. All right, then we just move on. Okay. Okay, so um, so let's take a look at a very common application here that's often called the two-period, two-groups model. So in this case, I'm going to split my sample into any any states that had the law in effect prior to in 1980 or before. I'm going to call them the treatment group. And any states that implemented the law after 1980, I'm going to call them the control group. And so that's how I'm going to set up my data. Now, obviously, I have time series data. So what I want to do is I want to zoom in on the years 1979 to 1981, and that puts that in, uh, the treatment in the middle of those two. So here is a graph of actually that data, just zooming in on the years 1979 and 1981 and drawing the treated group uh, with an orange line and the control group with a green line. So this is the actual data. It looks kind of like my example above, but I modeled the example after the, the way the data looked. 
Um, so that's what the data, the raw data looked like. And so I need to set up this data to fit these kinds of models. Now, this turns out to be a critically important step, and, and I'll emphasize this more along the way, but how you set up the data is very important for fitting the models, because if you set up the data correctly, fitting the models is trivially easy. If you don't, which I screwed up uh, quite badly the first couple times I did this, uh, I couldn't get my models to work properly, and all it, it all had to do with the way I'd set up the data. So I'm going to walk you through how to set up your data to do this. So I'm going to be using a data set that I created for uh, this talk called MLDA21. I got the data from someone else's GitHub repository who used the example from the Angerston uh, uh, Pischke book um, that I'll mention towards the end. Uh, so this is my version of that data set. And it has a lot of variables in it. We're going to focus on uh, the following variables. I have FIPS, which is a state ID. It's essentially just a state ID code, but it's used in creating maps. And so the the, um, the number has meaning in this case. So it's a state ID. State is just a label for the state. Year is the year, 1970 through 1970 or 1996. Uh, MLDA 21 year is the year in which the MLDA 21 law was enacted in a particular state. I'll show you the raw data here in a moment, uh, and I think it'll be a little more clear. MLDA 21 is an indicator for whether that point in time is pre or post MLDA 21 law. And then M rate age group is the outcome that we're going to be interested in. It's the mortality rate uh, measured in deaths per 100,000 population in the 18 to 20 age group. And then I've included a covariate here. There are other covariates in the actual data set. Uh, but we're going to consider the beer tax as a covariate in our examples today, okay? So there are roughly 1,242 observations in the data set. Don't have a, a lot of issues with missing data other than a little bit of missing data, data for the beer tax. I know this seems strange, but I always like to summarize the data and look at the number of observations just to check for missing data and weird things like that. So let's look at some raw data just to develop our intuition for what, what the data need to look like to fit these models. So on the left side, I have the data for Illinois. Illinois is a state here in the United States. The variable year obviously runs from 1970 to 1996, so it's time series data. And then uh, next to it is the variable MLDA21 year. That is the year 1980, and it's 1980 through the entire series because that's the year that the state of Illinois raised their drinking age to 21 years of age. So then if I look at the indicator variable MLDA21, notice that it's zero. It equals zero from 1970 through 1979. And then in 1980, that variable changes to a one. So it's an indicator for when the state was had the law in effect. I'm not going to use it. I'm not going to call it a treatment here. We'll come back to that. Then on the right side of the slide, I have the data for the variable Iowa, which is just to the west of Illinois. Its ML, uh, MLDA 21 year was 1986. So they implemented this law after 1980. So Iowa is a control state. And again, we have the year uh, 1970 through 1976. And if we look at the variable MLD, MLDA 21, notice that it's zero all the way through 1985. And it doesn't change to being a one until 1986. That's, again, when that law went into effect. So MLDA21 is not a treatment variable across the board. It's unique to each state, depending on when that law went into effect. And that's not the question I'm asking today. I'm wanting to use 1980 as my cutoff. So anyone before 1980 is, is treated. Anyone after 1980 is controlled. So here's the first thing I'm going to do with my data to fit this two-period, two-group model. I'm going to keep only the data in the interval 1979 to 1981. So I'll have data for 1979, 1980, and 1981. That's what that keep statement does. And then below that, I've listed uh, three states that represent the three possibilities uh, for how their treatment would sort of look. So in Illinois, the first uh, first two rows here represent Illinois. And in the year 1979, the law had not been implemented by 1979 in uh, Illinois. So MLDA 21 is a zero there. In 1981, the law was in effect. And so MLDA 21 is a one uh, at that time point for Illinois. 
Indiana had the law in effect all the way back in 1934, so they're a one for all observations. Iowa didn't start, uh, they didn't implement their law until 1986, so they're a zero always, okay? So that's essentially a treatment variable that's unique to each state. What I need, because I'm using 1980 as my cutoff, is I need a different variable to indicate time and group. So first off, let's talk about time. Time in this case, and again, this is critically important to setting this up to work correctly. Uh, and I keep saying that because I screwed it up and it took me two days to realize my dumb mistakes. Time equals zero if the intervention was prior to or during 1980. So, and then time equals one if the intervention occurred in 1980. Okay, wait, did I say that back? I said that backwards. Time equals zero prior to the intervention in 1980. And time equals one if the intervention occurred after, okay? So we're strictly talking about time, not treatment for that time, just time. Is this pre or post, okay? It's just pre or post, time prior to 1980 or 80 and beyond. Then I'm going to create a treatment variable, and I've shown the specific commands I used at the top here to generate the variable for treated. And there are more succinct ways to code this, but this is one of those times where being clever got me in trouble. And so rather than trying to be succinct and clever, I've written out the commands very explicitly as to what I'm doing to define the treatment variable. So treatment, in this case, uh, let's look at Illinois. Treat Well, let's talk about what it is first. Treatment equals one if the MLDA 21 law was in effect in that state during 1980 or sooner, okay? So Illinois has a one for both values of treated, both in 1979 and 1981. Now, that probably seems a little confusing because it, they weren't treated, the state wasn't treated in 1979, but that's not the question we're asking. We're just asking, was it treated ever? Not at some point in time, was it treated prior to 1980 or in 1980 or not? So uh, Indiana also was treated at some point during that per time period, and so it's a one for both observations. Now, Iowa was never treated in this interval, and so they're zero for both time points. So again, setting up that those time and treated variables can be kind of tricky. And if you mess this up, your an your, the answers will be incorrect, okay? Now, the last part is easy. I'm just gonna multiply those two together. So I'm gonna create this interaction term called time treat. And it's literally just the product of time times treated. So it's an interaction term in a regression model. So, but it plays a different role depending on which command we're using. And this can also be confusing. And it is in the manual, but you have to read it very carefully to catch this. And I didn't, which is why I'm emphasizing it so much now. So uh, that variable time treat will serve as an interaction term if we use the regress command. So if we use good old regress, that's just an interaction term in the model. And we'll use time and treat, treat it. But if we're using the new DID regress commands or D, uh, XT DID regress, the treatment variable, when it asks us for the treatment variable, the treatment variable we put in is time treat. It's actually what we I would think of as the interaction term. And this caused a lot of confusion for me when I first started using this. Um, so I was using the treated variable as treated with DID regress, and I couldn't get my results to match, and I couldn't figure out why. Again, I'm say it again only because it's super, super important. If you're using the DID regress command or XTDID regress, time treat is actually the treatment variable. Okay. When it asks for the treatment variable, that's it. All right. So now we have our data set up. We can actually start fitting some models. So we could do this with the good old linear, just the regress command. So I could type regress, uh, M rate age group. That's my dependent variable. That's that mortality rate in that 18 to 20 age group. And then I'm going to include my three variables, time treated and time treat, which is that interaction term. Now, because the data are clustered, if I scroll back up, notice that I have two observations, technically three if you include 1980. I have multiple observations per uh, cluster, per unit for each state. And so I need to take that into account. And so I'm gonna use cluster robust standard errors, uh, taking into account the clustering by state. Remember, FIPS is that state ID, okay? So if I fit this model, 
Uh, the thing I'm paying attention to is the coefficient, the estimated coefficient for the time treat variable. That's that interaction term. And that turns out to be my average treatment effect among the treated, that ATET. It's that coefficient for time treat. Now, we're going to ignore the standard errors for now, but this coefficient should be estimated correctly, uh, assuming the, uh, we'll come back to the parallel trends assumption here in a moment. But if that holds and other assumptions hold, that should be a good estimate of the average treatment effect among the treated, the ATET. Now, uh, the interpretation of this, if we can rule out other, uh, other possible causes, we would just say that the MLDA-21 laws caused a decrease of 4.6 people per 100,000 population in the 18 to 20 year old age group between 1979 and 1981, okay? The change in these laws had a direct effect on the, on the, uh, the mortality rate. And specifically it was a 4.6 uh, people per 100,000 population decrease in deaths, um, which for a large population, that would be a, a substantial number of lives saved, okay? So that's how I would fit this using the regress command. Uh, now, you're probably thinking, well, why don't we just use factor variables for that, factor variable notation? And you could. You don't necessarily have to create that time treat variable manually. So we could use factor variable notation where we specify the I dot uh, to tell Stata that time is, is uh, categorical and treat it as categorical, and then the double hashtag in the middle request the main effect of time and the main effect of treated as well as the interaction between time and treated. So that that's just a shorthand way of writing that. And that gives us, again, this interaction term in here, time by treated. And again, that estimates that average treatment effect among the treated. Same number, minus 4.6. Again, for now, we're going to ignore the standard errors. But we are using uh, still using cluster robust standard errors to account for the uh, the clustering and the repeated observations over time, okay? So another way that you could fit this model using regress, and this one is actually shown in the manual, uh, partly because it gives you uh, more correct standard errors, is we can also use the regress command. We're st we still have our dependent variable just like we did before. We're going to include a main effect for time or year, this variable year. And then I'm also going to include time treat. That's that interaction variable. And I'm also going to treat uh, state as a fixed effect in the model. So I'm going to estimate a separate uh, mean, so to speak, for each, it's a rate, but a separate uh, coefficient for each of these states in the United States. So here where it says FIPS in the output, that FIPS output keeps going for another 48, 47 more uh, coefficients down below that, okay? Because we're treating state as a fixed effect. And again, we are using cluster robust standard errors. So just another way, there. those are three different ways you could fit this using the regress command. There are also ways you can do this with AREG and XTREG and some other things, but that's sort of the basics. Now, the cool thing is we don't have to do all of these things manually. DID regress, it's a newer command in Stata, will handle a lot of these things for you. So this is what the dialog box looks like. I'm not going to uh, go through the dialog box. I'd rather focus on the syntax. So here's the syntax for the DID regress command. The first set of parentheses asks for the outcome variable. So OVAR is the outcome variable. And then OMVAR list is the outcome model variable list. So if you want to include any covariates in your model, that's the place to include them. And then I assume most of you are familiar with the triple slashes. That means this command continues on the next line. And then I have the next set of parentheses that contains the treatment variable. So that's T var, okay? And it could be continuous. Stata is expecting a binary treatment, but you can include continuous treatment. So you would just use comma continuous to specify a continuous treatment rather than a binary treatment. And then below that, I have groups. Uh, groups. So that's going to be the grouping variable. Uh, so whatever the groups are, in my case, it's state. Uh, I need to specify the grouping variable. And then I also can, and I often will specify a time variable. In this case, I only have two time points. Uh, so I don't necessarily need that. But uh, for other models, you can specify a time variable. And then you can include other options that we'll talk about later. So that's the generic syntax. At the bottom, I've written out my specific syntax for my uh, particular model. So the outcome variable is M rate uh, underscore age group. That's the, the mortality rate in that age group. 
And I'm not going to include any covariates for now. I could, but I'm going to save that for later. Below that, I'm going to specify my treatment variable. And notice, and I can't emphasize this enough, only because this cost me two days of my life and a lot of frustration. This is the variable time treat. It is not just treat. Okay, that's that interaction variable, time times treat, the way that we set up those variables earlier. So when it asks for the treatment variable, in our example, that's time treat, not treat. Okay. And then uh, the grouping variable is FIPS because FIPS is that state ID. And then the time variable is year because that tells us whether we're uh, pre or post. Um, I actually, I should have put time in there rather than year because I created my own time variable, but it doesn't really matter in this case. Okay, so I can run DID regress. So here's my command at the top. And it will then show me in the output, uh, the control group is time treat equals zero. Treatment is time treat equals one. Uh, it tells me the number of states or groups in the control group and the treated group. It tells me the minimum time. So those don't have to be the same. In our example, they happen to be the same. And then at the bottom, it's going to show us the average, the ATET, the average treatment effect among the treated. And notice that it's the same coefficient that we got before when we used the regress command. It's a, a decrease of 4.6 per 100,000 population. Now, what's nice here is we get correct standard errors, and that's something that I, I didn't really emphasize earlier, but there are certain versions of the regress command that don't uh, estimate correct standard errors, and DID regress will do that for you, um, and we don't have to go into the details of why. Um, actually, we will here in a moment, uh, but we've correctly estimated the uh, the average treatment effect among the treated. So that's the that's the command, DID regress, makes it really easy to do this. Now, what re really makes it easy to do is checking the uh, parallel trends assumption. Now, if you had to do this manually, which I've actually done, you have to collapse the data and calculate means for each of the groups. And it can be done, and it's not a lot of code, but this makes it so much easier to simply type ESTAT trend plots. And what this is going to do, it's a post-estimation command for DID regress, and it shows that same graph that I showed you before. And uh, it does it automatically. You don't have to collapse the data or do anything like that. It just creates it automatically. So we can see visually that it looks like prior to the treatment, the, uh, the trajectories or the, the uh, trends were pretty much parallel. Maybe not exactly, but they're pretty close to parallel. And then, of course, that changes on the other side uh, of the treatment after 1980. And on, then on the right, we see a linear trends model that's based on the model that we fit. So we can see that the uh, the treatment group is going down at a faster rate uh, than the control group. So this is a nice way to visually check that uh, parallel trends assumption. There's also another uh, post-estimation command called ESTAT Granger, which will test this. It'll actually put a p-value to it. The null hypothesis it states here is that it, there's no effect in anticipation of the treatment. But essentially what this is testing is that uh, parallel trends assumption. And here the p-value is much greater than 0.05. So again, that, that uh, should be of comfort that we are meeting the parallel trends assumption. And remember, that is very important uh, for drawing collect con correct conclusions and not having a biased estimate of the average treatment effect. Now, if we wanted, we could include some covariates in our model. So here I've added beer tax in the first set of parentheses. So the, in the first set of parentheses, the first variable is the outcome variable. And then the any variables that follow are the outcome model or covariate. So here I've included beer tax. And we can see that when we adjust for beer tax, the average treatment effect actually becomes larger. Now it's 5.14, 5.14 decrease in the mortality rate. So this is one of those cases where adjusting for a covariate actually made the effect larger. Um, so it's easy to adjust for covariates in here. Now, estimation of standard errors, you can do this in the dialog box. Uh, but for large, for large numbers of groups, this is really easy. It's the usual cluster robust standard errors. And uh, the critical values and the confidence intervals need to be based on a T distribution uh, using G minus one degrees of freedom, where G is the number of groups. So if you have a large number of groups, this is just like using good old cluster robust standard errors. It's easy to do. If you have a small number of groups, things become a bit more complicated. And uh, you're going to need to use uh, a, one of a variety of techniques that relies on something called the wild bootstrap. 
And uh, we're not going to crawl down this rabbit hole here today. We don't have time to do that. But suffice to say, I've copied a section of the help file uh, just so you can see there are lots of different options for dealing with small numbers of groups for different situations and things like that. Okay. So that's the basic version, the two period, two groups model that I, I talked about in the intuitive introduction. So any questions up to here? I think I'm doing, am I doing okay on time? Uh, one question here. Do we interpret average treatment effects on the treated the same way you would uh, interpret the interaction? So in the example, the average treatment effect on the treated had a p-value larger than 0 0.05? Ah, yes. Yeah, so it does have a larger, mm -hmm. it does have a p-value yes. greater than 0 0.05. So that's an issue, and I'm kind of glossing over that, yeah. But you would interpret it the same way as that same a statistic. Way, exactly. uh, we're we're really, really not supposed to use, to use that word. Exactly. Oh, I'm sorry. Good. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, the American Statistical Association has tried to to get us to stop using that term statistically significant. Um, but it's such a bad habit that I keep using it. But yeah, that's what that p-value is indicating there. Yeah. There's another question here. Um, sure. Did you look at two periods of three? So you had, you, you mentioned 1979, 1980, and 1981. Okay, so I'm busted. Yeah, so I actually am including 1980 in there. And if you don't, the command will actually complain and say that it needs two time points prior to, I'm trying to rewind here. Oh, let's just go back to, here we go. You actually need two time points in order to check this parallel uh, trends assumption. And so I am actually using the 1980 data. When I showed the raw data up above, when I listed it, I skipped 1980 in the middle because I'm wanting to focus on this pre and post notion. But in fact, you really do need, and, and DID regress will complain, if you don't include two points prior to the treatment or one point prior and one point at treatment and then one post measurement. Yeah, it's a good question. Mm -hmm. And it really needs that in order to check this parallel trends assumption. Um, you have to have the, the, at least two time points to sort of check that before going to uh, time, the post time. Right. Good question. Um, another question is about whether the, the um, coefficients are being displayed by the DID rec command. Like if you control for covariates, you probably get both. Um, I, there's a way in the options to have it display that, but since most people are just interested in the average treatment effect, that's what's displayed. I'm, there's a co, uh, option, and I don't remember what it is to force it to. Oh, it's. I'm going to think of it as soon as we get offline. But there is a way to have it display that. Yeah, yeah. There's actually a number of other questions I just got, but I I do think perhaps we leave them to the end because okay, I don't want to have a major interruption we were we were ahead of time let's not get behind time yeah yes, yes. okay so uh, a couple of variations on this um let's talk about repeated cross-sectional panel data this is really longitudinal data but for now i'm just going to consider it as panel data as having groups because i have lots of observations on each of the groups and i'm not going to take the time part into account because this these could be hospitals or something where uh, I just have a bunch of patients in a hospital. And so the the fact that it's time series is uh, we're going to hang on and come back to that in a moment. So let's just consider this to be repeated cross-sectional data. I'd like to take all of the data into account, all of the pre-data and all of the post-data. And I can do that by just not deleting all the time, the time points outside of that range of 1979 to 1981. So just to emphasize it one more time before we go back down this road, I'm going to put in here actually how I opened the data and created that time variable, treated, and then time times treat. Again, this is mostly for reminding me because I messed up so badly when I was working on this. So that's how I would set up the data. And again, just to show you the raw data for Illinois, I'm now using all of the data from 1970 to 1996, okay? And this time treat variable right here, that's the treatment variable that I'm putting into DID regress. So again, I just type DID regress. Time treat is the treatment variable. I have the same. In fact, the command is identical to what it is before. The command stayed the same. The only thing that changed is the data that I'm using. I have all the data for the entire span of 70 to 96. OK. 
Okay. Now, of course, the output looks a little different. If we look at the time uh, in time in the output, it now ranges from 1970 to 1981 uh, in the treatment group. This should include through 96. Why is that not? Anyway, I'll figure that out later. Um, it's going to bug me anyway. Uh, and then we have the average treatment effect, uh, average ATET estimated at the bottom. And notice when we take all of the data into account, the coefficient is a little bit smaller. It's uh, about a 3.27, call it a 3.3 uh, per people per uh, 100,000 population decrease in the mortality rate. Okay, so it dropped a little bit when we take all of the data into account over time. Again, we can use ESTAT trend plots in order to check this uh, parallel trends assumption. These look relatively parallel. Obviously, they're not straight lines, um, but they do sort of track together. Uh, so visually, I would sort of consider that to be roughly parallel trends. And then I see the linear trends model on the right here. And so it looks visually to, to meet that assumption. And if I do this, uh, type this ESTAT Granger uh, command again and check the p-value, again, the p-value is uh, is much greater than 0.05. I was going to go back and look. This uh, still has a p-value that's much greater than 0.05. So even though I keep saying that it's leading to a 3.2, 3.3 decrease in the uh, mortality rate, I have to sort of add the caveat that that is uh, with a p-value that's quite a bit larger than 0.05. So this may or may not be relevant, okay? Now, longitudinal panel data, which is really what we have. This actually is longitudinal panel data because I have repeated observations uh, over time on clusters of data. And so now it's, I keep reusing this slide, but it's the same data. I'm, but this time I'm going to XT set the data. And so I'm gonna tell it the clustering variable as well as the year variable and tell uh, XT set that it's uh, measured yearly. And now I can run XTDID regress. And uh, in this case, I get pretty much the same results as I did last time, but it is taking into account the longitudinal nature of the data. So I've kind of used this same data that really was panel longitudinal data all along and pretended it wasn't earlier. This is technically the correct way we should be analyzing uh, these data. And again, we can use the uh, ESTAT trend plots to check that uh, parallel trends assumption and we can use ESTAT Granger again and check that uh, using a statistical test, okay? So that's sort of the basics of difference and differences. That's kind of how it works. The main thing I would say is be very, very careful. I know I keep emphasizing this, but there's a video, uh, and I'll show you the video, and a link to the video in a moment. But in the video, uh, the instructor says, pay very, very careful attention to how you structure the data. And I was watching that section, kind of fast forwarded through going, yeah, 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 I, I got the basics, just show me the rest. And I sort of glossed over it. And I did the same thing when I read the manual and it burned me because I didn't read carefully. So be really, really careful. I can't emphasize that enough and how you structure the data because once you get it structured, everything else is really simple to do. So if you'd like to learn more, uh, please read the manuals. We uh, The manuals have more than just the syntax. Uh, they include worked examples. Um, and so there's a lot of information here. Um, if you're not aware of this, DID regress is in one manual. That's in the treatment manual. But XT DID regress begins with the letters XT. And so it, that command is actually in the uh, longitudinal data panel data manual. So the commands are in two separate manuals. Um, uh, there are lots of good books on this. The ones that I happen to have at home because I've been working on this at home a lot uh, were the Cameron and Trevitti book. The, uh, they have a nice section in the new book on uh, uh, difference and differences. Bruce Hansen's book that came out last year, I got my copies in a while back and I hadn't looked at the DID section. It has a real nice uh, clear explanation of DID. And then I borrowed the idea for this from this little book called Mastering Metrics. That's where I got the idea for the, they they use, they do a version of this uh, MLDA law example in their book, Mastering Metrics. It's by Angrist and Pischke. I think in the, I wasn't familiar with it, but I think in the econ world, this is a classic example that I just probably hadn't heard of. So if you'd like to learn more, check those out. I wanted to, to mention this uh, video from YouTube. It's from Richard Gallenstein's uh, YouTube channel. 
He is a professor. I forget. I should remember, but I don't remember where he's a professor. But he recorded a really nice introduction to DID. And I've put a link in here because you'll notice uh, a lot of the way he describes this. I have borrowed, stolen, whatever you call it, uh, in my explanation. And so I wanted to give credit to that, that a lot of the way I explained it above is borrowed or stolen even from uh, directly from Richard Gallenstein's YouTube video. So if you want to learn more, check that out. It's like an hour and a half or something. It goes into a lot more detail uh, than what I covered here. Um, I've added a couple of links here. I want to go through and add more. I just haven't had time. Uh, one of these, this Mirren and Tettelbaum paper, is a paper that actually analyzes this data set. The U.S. National, Cha National Highway Traffic Safety Administration Information website has a really, really nice explanation of uh, what a, what caused these changes in mortality over time. And they address the drinking laws, but some other things that may have had, had impacts as well. So those links are in here. Um, again, you can download the slides, data sets, and do files uh, for the everything here at tinyurl.com slash stata DID. And I don't know how we're doing on time, but I'm happy to answer questions as best I can. Um, now, and if you think of them later on, shoot me an email at chuber at stated.com. Okay. Great. Thanks. Uh, Thanks thank for being you here. so much, Chuck. That's, that's really excellent. We do have plenty of time left and I will probably leave it to David to decide later what we're going to do if we will just, um, be a bit earlier or take a break at some point. I have a number okay. of questions here. Um, perhaps <laughs> I uh, hope I can answer them. I'm not an econometrician, so, but fire away. Um, the first one is about the timing of when you measure the outcome. So what is the best time to estimate the average treatment effect uh, on the treated? Is it when we see the change in trend in our data? I guess that's that's probably a, <laughs> a general oh. question about when you should be collecting your data. Yeah, I'm sure you and half the people in the audience can explain this better than I can. But there are a lot of subtleties yeah. to this that I've completely glossed over, such as anticipation effects. Exactly. Uh, people may, in this case, people know the law is going to go into effect, and they may start changing their behavior before the law goes into effect. So there may be these anticipation effects or things like that. So I think it, to some extent, depends on the specific example you're looking at. Uh, as to whether or not there are these sorts of anticipation or lagging effects. One of the issues with this data set is in that window in between 19, call it 1980 and 1988, the laws were changing. And so if you lived on a border of a state, for instance, in Illinois, the law changed in 1980, but it didn't in Iowa. So if you lived near the border of Iowa, you could just drive across the border and go buy uh, alcohol if you were you know, 19 or 20, and then drive back across the border into Illinois, because it's not, it was not illegal in uh, Iowa, but it is in Illinois. So those kinds of issues can mess things up um, in terms of having a very hard line where something was perfectly one way before the treatment or intervention and perfectly different after. Mm -hmm. um, so I um, think you, you would have to look at that on a case-by-case -case basis. I don't know that yes, there's a... I, I agree. It would very much depend on the application and the context, I, I would assume. Um, yeah. I have another question here um, that I don't fully understand. Maybe you can make sense of it. Um, given the treatment is invoked at different times, would you not consider aligning the rates to T equals zero with before-after analysis for all states or units? Okay, so this is creeping into uh, what I believe Professor Wildridge is going to be talking about next, which, or maybe not, I'm not entirely certain. <laughs> but uh, what I, my understanding is they're called heterogeneous uh, difference and differences models, where the timing of the treatment is different. And so that's an interesting suggestion to simply align them all, take what they actually did and align them rather than picking an arbitrary date uh, like I did. But there are more sophisticated models that actually allow for the treatment to occur at different times in different groups. And those are heterogeneous DID models. And uh, those can be done in Stata. Um, and I believe that's what Professor Wildridge is gonna talk about next. So we'll hear more about that. Mm -hmm. Hope rather, I'm not totally wrong uh, about that. A question about the uh, command, the DID regress command, the OM var list 
option in the command. Can you just clarify once more? I think that that was the these were the control variables, correct? Sure. Some people call them control variables or covariates or yeah, yeah. Uh, other variables that you want to adjust for in the model. Um, so right, there's the OVAR is the outcome variable, and OM var list is the outcome model var list. That's what the OM stands for. This outcome model var list. I think part of the reason it's confusing is that the syntax deviates from usual state of regress syntax, where you just type dependent variable and then give it a list of covariates. Um, you type the uh, outcome variable first along with the model, and the treatment variable actually comes after that. Um, but that's because Stata needs to know, DID regress needs to know what is specifically the, the treatment variable of interest. Yeah. Which again, I'll say it for an eighth time probably, it's not just the treatment variable, it's that interaction of treatment and time. Uh, so <laughs> I have an interesting question here about whether it's possible to add random effects instead of fixed effects, or perhaps it's even, I don't know, oh, a way to do both. I, I reckon with I the XT, XT uh, DID regress, I don't know if there's you a can, effects option. <laughs> yeah, you can fit these models with XTDID, XT reg and use the FE or RE options. So I know you could do it, but I don't know how to do it with DID regress. There's probably a way, and I'm just not familiar with it. Yeah. Um, I guess yeah, comparing the, the original commands, the XT rec command with the new DID commands is probably a good idea to see if they produce yeah. similar results. Right, um, yeah. That actually brings me to another question, if I may, we, we still have plenty of time, so I was actually okay. wondering, like, a more general question now that you've looked at the DID regress command so closely, um, do you expect that it will help people make fewer mistakes than compared to using the standard regress commands and so regress. on? Regress. What, what, what would be the things we would have to look out for if we just use the DID. DID regress. To me, the thing that it gets you most easily are the parallel trends assumption checks after those graphs. Because yeah. if you don't, if you do it manually and you can, uh, and I, that's how I knew I was doing it wrong. Right. Otherwise, I would have had no clue that I was doing this wrong as I tried to do it several different ways when I was working on the slides. And I couldn't get the results to match between the different regress commands and uh, the DID regress command. So I knew somehow my intuition wasn't working properly and I was doing this on the weekend and I didn't want to bug the guy who wrote the command on the weekend. And so I kept messing with it and messing with it and I just could not figure it out. And when I went in on Monday morning and he explained, oh no, that's that treat times time, I, was, I felt like an idiot. And it is in the manual. You just, it's one of those things that maybe it was just arrogance on my part, but I kept thinking, oh yeah, 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 yeah. When I would read those sections, I would kind of gloss over it going, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what a treatment variable is. Let's just move along, move along. And that turned out to burn me. Um, so I would say, yeah, if the, the main thing that DID regress gets you are those parallel trends plots and the test, because that's so important. And you can do that manually, but you have to use collapse. You have to collapse your data uh, to get the means at each of the points. And then to plot them, to visualize it, uh, you have to you would have to col first collapse and then create the graph. And then the test, you could probably do the test manually as well. But with DID regress, it's just three quick, quick commands. You type DID regress, you fit the model, type ESTAT uh, P-trends, and it checks the, the assumption. It's just a lot quicker and easier to do once, right. once you know how to use it correctly. Yep. Yeah. It's probably a good idea to try out both initially to make sure you, you're producing the correct results. <laughs> but I agree. It, yeah. it looks like it, it will probably reduce making mistakes in those areas. If you get the treatment variable right, then yes. you will get the right clustered standard errors. There's there's a lot of debate oh. around like what should be the standard errors that people use. I've seen a few blog um, discussion forums about that. That's an excellent point too. The the standard errors, and I said it a couple of times, but the standard errors you get with some of the more basic regress commands are not correct. And so that's the other thing you get by using the DID regress uh, is you get correct standard errors. And if you have problems with small group sizes, there's all the different uh, wild bootstrap options to deal with that that's just not there for regress. So yeah, it's a specialty command just for fitting these kinds of models. Mm -hmm. 
Right. There's a question here about the parallel trends. Um, okay. Whether it's it's actually testable, um, because we would think that the parallel trends, trends assumption um, is an assumption about the potential outcomes, which are not actually the observed outcomes. And the test, the Granger test um, that you show is based on the observed outcomes, obviously. And therefore, um, the question is, is, is that actually a correct parallel trends test? I don't have a good answer for that. I'm, yeah, it's again, a good, I'm it's sorry. A good I'm a question. Um, yeah, it's definitely a valid point. We're not looking. Of course, we can't. We can't observe <laughs> the, the potential outcomes. Um, there's That's a question the, about the interpretation um, when we transform when we take a log transformation of the outcome variable. I believe mm -hmm. the answer is simply we have an interpretation in percent rather than units. Um, not sure if there's anything more to say about that. Sure. Yeah, I mean, that's just a typical issue with interpreting transformed dependent variables. And Jeff Woodridge just uh, responded that R RE, random effects, gives the same answer as TWFE. I don't know exactly what that means. WFE. I'm not, I'm not sure. Verify it in his presentation. Um, this is, this is the danger of being a biostatistician talking about an econ topic in front of a bunch of econ people as you guys ask questions that I just, I'm just not that familiar with your literature. So, yeah. Uh, um, variables that affect outcomes may not only be group and time. Um, do other influential variables need to be included in the model? Um, I don't know what to do. Do they need to be? I guess if they are influential, they would need to be in the model, but I'm not sure yeah. I understand the question. Yeah, I'm not sure. I reckon it would depend on the context. Two-way fixed effects. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> that's uh, the, <laughs> ah, okay. the answer. <laughs> right. Oh, okay. That's how you would that's how you would model it. Um just looking, do I have any? I had one more question, if I may, about the um, the unit you're using. You've presented a, um, an example with states. Mm -hmm. um, what would happen if we had collected individual level data within those states and you would do the same kind of DID analysis? I think you would still cluster your standard errors at the state level. Is that correct? If you just had individuals and not... Within states? Right. I think so. I think you just yeah. would cluster them. It'd be like the hospital data. There's another example that I read somewhere that used hospital data. In fact, it may be in the manual. I think it is in our manual, where it's just people grouped within hospitals. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And there was, well, oh, so the question then is, is what if you have one observation per group? Maybe I'm not understanding the question. Oh, you, you would have... You would have several observations within each state. You would have individuals, for example. Right. Say so you're not looking at mortality rate. Oh, so you're double clusters. At... I think yeah. I'm maybe remembering this incorrectly, but I think you can specify multiple grouping variables. Uh, let me. I'm probably wrong about that. That's probably right. I might have seen that somewhere. We don't have to I, discuss I have it to... now. It's just one of. I was just interested in it, but it's not a question. Yeah. Point. I copied um, the syntax right out of the manual. Let me scroll up and find that syntax statement because it may say grouping vars. I don't see it. Um, that's okay. I can look it up later. Okay. I think it's probably a good point in time now to wrap up. Um, and I should remind uh, people that we have Chuck speaking on in our Stata developer session later. So um, there can also be, you can also provide comments and, and feedback um, later on. So thank you very much, Jack. Yeah, I just, I pulled it up. Group VARs, it is VARs, plural. So you can have multiple grouping variables. I found it. So anyway. Okay, well, thanks again. Thanks for having me. Thank you.